Thank you all for joining us today to discuss the importance of the Affordable Connectivity Program. My name is Lauren Harriman, and I had the privilege of managing the organization for this rally to save the FCC's Affordable Connectivity Program. Before we get started, please remember that we are recording, so if you prefer not to be on camera, please sit in the back of the room. Additionally, if you leave this room and make a right, you will see the restrooms. We encourage you to post on X or your preferred social media platform during the rally. Please use the hashtag SaveACP. Without further ado, please welcome Public Knowledge's CEO and President, Chris Lewis. Thank you, Elle. Elle's doing a fantastic job for us as, uh, in her fellowship with Public Knowledge. So uh, if you don't know about our fellowship program, check it out at publicknowledge.org. Uh, from her to Elisa Valentin, who helped organize this, uh, who was a fellow many years ago. It's a great program to make sure we, we keep tech policy space, space as diverse and as talented as possible. Um, thank you guys for being here. Uh, welcome. Yeah, that's so polite. We're calling this a rally, you guys. <laughs> We're so glad that we have a full room here. Um, uh, I said thank you to Lauren. Uh, we have so many wonderful partners here, uh, members of a broad coalition here to support the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, today's a big day, you guys. We've been waiting, well, we've been waiting and advocating for over a year for the Affordable Connectivity Program to be renewed. And uh, the sad news is that today is the end of April. And so after today, the funding is officially running out or run out. I know we have some FCC commissioners here. They, they're careful with the details. Uh, they're making it stretch a few more days, but let's be real. Uh, if we don't have Congress Act, we are going to lose this important subsidy that keeps people connected to broadband all across the country in every corner of every state. So we're so glad you guys are here because we need to continue to rally and push for this important cause. Uh, I wanna thank our partners in putting this together, our friends at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, they have people here, yeah, they're amazing. The National Hispanic Media Coalition, Digital Progress Institute, Civic Nation, all these folks are represented here in the room, and some of them, like NDIA, and some of you guys have people around the country working to get people connected to broadband. We also want to thank our, our media partners who are streaming this uh, for us live. We couldn't have done it without them, the broadband breakfast team over there on the side of the room. If you guys don't know them, sign up for their, for their emails and their programming. They're fantastic. Uh, we are also joined by a lot of other allies. Like I said, we have a broad coalition. I don't know anyone that's truly against extending the ACP, and it's brought together people uh, that we work with all the time at Public Knowledge. Uh, we're just one small part of this coalition here in D.C., as well as folks that sometimes we don't agree with, but that's okay. That's how good policy gets made. So I see uh, folks from industry here. I saw, I saw U.S. Telecom in the room. Uh, good to have you guys here representing the, the big telco companies, cable industry is behind this. Um, left and right civil society, it doesn't matter if you're conservative or, or, or liberal, uh, folks want this program to be renewed. Uh, and so we thank you all for being a part of this and engaging all of your, your allies and all of your stakeholders uh, in this fight. Um, we're going to have some, some important folks come up here and talk about why this rally is important, why we need to renew the program, uh, including Senator Welch, we expect to be here uh, later on in the program. Uh, we also have a couple FCC commissioners here as well, and, and a representative from the White House should be joining us. So uh, we have folks from all over official Washington uh, here because they know this is important, and sometimes Sometimes Congress and Washington are slow to act, but we have faith in them, and they have faith in them. And that's why we're here, even on this last day of the program, because it's never too late for them to do the right thing and to, uh, and to fund the Affordable Connectivity Program. The Affordable Connectivity Program has been incredibly successful at getting individuals and families connected to the internet. It eases the emotional burden and the time tax associated with making sacrifices in one's life and in their budget to get access to this essential 21st century network. 
Uh, it's also been a major part of the equation in closing the digital divide in other ways. Those of you policy nerds in the room know that uh, there's multiple reasons why people don't have broadband. Uh, affordability is one of the most important, one of the biggest ones. But it also contributes to uh, helping the broadband providers build out to areas that they there where people don't have broadband because it increases the number of people in those remote rural areas that can afford to sign up for broadband. So it's all a part of closing the digital, the digital divide. Um, the public knowledge, um, we know, like many of you know in the room, uh, that the ACP has been a short-term fix and that we're looking for a long-term fix to have sustainable long-term uh, subsidies for broadband. Uh, but while we work to get there, we need this program, the ACP, refunded right now. Um, there is a bill uh, out there, the Bipartisan ACP Extension Act, uh, led by Congresswoman Clark, uh, by Senator Welch on the Democratic side, uh, on the Republican side, Senator Vance, uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, and many other folks from both parties who are supporting this bill to restore uh, the uh, Affordable Connectivity Program. And, and we've even hear, hear talk of a discussion this week uh, that maybe Congress will look to uh, extend the program by attaching an extension to a spectrum bill. Uh, the uh, spectrum policy bill is moving through the Senate right now, and we would welcome that. Anything to restore this program so we can get on on, on with the task of figuring out what the long-term solution for uh, connectivity and affordable subsidies are. Uh, let's see here. Oh, one more important thing before uh, I bring up our, our guest speakers um, is where we are. Uh, we are in Washington, D.C. Some of you are watching online, and, and we hope you, you share on social media that this is happening right now. We want as many people as possible to know about the urgency of re restoring the ACP. Uh, but while we're in Washington, D.C., we are not uh, up on Capitol Hill, where uh, my team of lobbyists who work on behalf of the public interest, some of the industry lobbyists in the House, uh, spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill. No, we're here at a library. We're here in the community where uh, official Washington may live, but also unofficial Washington, folks who aren't fancy live and work and come to learn and to read. Uh, we are at a place called the Shaw Watha T. Daniel Public Library. Now, Shaw is the name of the neighborhood that we're in, uh, but uh, Watha T. Daniel is, is a very special person. You see, back in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, Shaw was a home to banks and department stores, markets. Uh, it, was, it was a living, working community, um, and then was upended uh, by uh, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968. Uh, and there's turmoil in this neighborhood. Uh, and some merchants moved away to other areas and, and uh, never came back or didn't reopen. Uh, and some, a few stayed behind to revitalize uh, this neighborhood and this community. Two of them, uh, uh, one of them, if you're a, a DC local, uh, you may have heard of, Walter Fontroy, uh, important civic leader here in Washington, DC. Uh, but the other was a, a man named Watha T. Daniel, <coughs> who this library is named after. Uh, and those two leaders, Mr. Daniel and Mr. Fontroy, uh, founded the Model Inner City Community Organization, a group of Shaw-based professionals who worked for a neighborhood resurgence. They used federal grants. Fancy that. They use federal grants and other funding sources to build public housing and provide services to residents. Uh, and according to the historians working to preserve DC history, this community organization also gave voice to the community and how this money would be spent. It was a ground up effort using federal dollars. That's exactly what we have going on here to renew the ACP. And so we think that it is uh, apropos that we are here in the spirit of Watha T. Daniel asking all of you, asking all of you online uh, to let your voice be heard from the ground up, from the community, to use these federal funds to make people's lives better, to build community online and connect more people to the, the essential network of the 21st century, uh, and that's uh, broadband internet. So we're going to get this done with your help. We're going to get this done with your energy, and 
Uh, we're going to get this done with the support of some tremendous policymakers, and I want to bring a couple up here uh, right now. The first is uh, Commissioner, uh, yep, Commissioner Ana Gomez. Uh, Commissioner Ana Gomez is uh, the newest member of the Federal Communications Commission, the agency that uh, they just confirmed, again, has authority over broadband uh, in this country and oversight over that service. Thank you. Um, and uh, for a long time, we were without a fifth commissioner and couldn't move forward with important things. Uh, so I never get tired of saying how excited I am that you are here, Commissioner Gomez, and at the FCC. We want to welcome her up. Uh, please welcome FCC Commissioner Ada Gomez. There you go, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> so good morning, and thank you to Public Knowledge and Partners for holding this rally today, and thank you to Chris for that kind introduction. So we know that broadband internet access is essential to participating in modern life. It touches every aspect of our work, our education, our health care, and so much more. It can create unbounded opportunity for those that have access to it, while at the same time be a locked door to the futures of those who do not. And like never before, closing America's digital divide is within our reach. This is because the bipartisan infrastructure law created the Affordable Connectivity Program, the largest broadband affordability effort in our nation's history. This critical program has helped over 123, oh God, no, 23 million households get and stay connected to high-speed internet. That means one in six households benefit from the ACP. Over half of subscribers are Americans over the age of 50. Four million of that number are seniors living on a fixed income. One in four households is Latino, and one in four households is African-American. As we've heard, the ACP is the most successful tool we've ever had to closing the digital divide because it finally addresses the long overlooked yet critical affordability piece of the puzzle. And our data show that households in both urban areas and rural areas have benefited from the program. This is not a blue state or a red state issue. The ACP is a bipartisan issue. So today, I join you to raise the alarm about why failing to refund the ACP is really a bad idea. It's bad for our economy and bad for families across this country. First, this will be disastrous for families who are already struggling to pay the bills. That is certain. Families will be faced with the tough decision on whether to pay for their broadband or pay bills, or put food on the table, pay for childcare, or pay their electric bill. Next, ACP ending will have an economic and competitive consequence. We know that access to connectivity is a game changer for economic opportunity that can open the playing field for education, job opportunity, work, and business. Not only that, but it will put at risk our nation's historic investment to deploy broadband to everyone everywhere, especially rural areas. For low-income rural Americans, the ACP has been a lifeline to ensuring they have access to connectivity. If we allow ACP to end, fewer households will be able to afford service, and this will impact the economics of deploying broadband in rural areas. Without it, some providers may hesitate to deploy in rural areas over fear that the investment will not be sustainable. Put simply, without ACP, the billions of dollars that Congress passed to deploy broadband will not go as far and will fail to maximize the benefits of this investment. This will be felt particularly in rural communities who have been waiting for connectivity to finally come to them. It is, as they say, penny wise and pound foolish. Finally, we jeopardize trust. Building trust between government and low income consumers is challenging. If Congress fails to refund the ACP, we jeopardize the trust that we've built with these vulnerable consumers. 
This is a critical moment. Connectivity has never been more important, and we now know what it takes to close the digital divide. There is so much promise and opportunity if we are just willing to get up and take it. I am continuing to fight to see this program refunded, and despite the hour, I am also hopeful that Congress will act. There are a number of proposals that have been introduced in Congress that have bipartisan, bicameral support, including the ACP Extension Act, which Congresswoman Clark and Senator Welch introduced earlier this year. I urge Congress to act to extend the ACP so that millions of families will not lose this critical support for high-speed internet, and so that we can continue to maintain U.S. economic leadership in an increasingly digital world. We've made too much progress and come too far to turn back. So let's save the Affordable Connectivity Program. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gomez. Um, next, I want to bring up a, a young man who I've known for a long time. <laughs> He's laughing. No, uh, we have known each other for a couple decades now, and uh, uh, he is uh, a longtime champion uh, at the FCC uh, for affordability issues, whether it's the Lifeline program, whether it was the uh, emergency broadband benefit, those of you who remember that one, uh, and now the Affordable Connectivity Program, and he's traveled the country uh, uh, advocating and, and meeting with folks in communities uh, just like this one uh, about the importance of, of these issues. So I want to bring up Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. I too am going to have to. Yes, yes. No, no, no. Uh, well, thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, first, let me say, uh, I'm also an optimist here. Uh, and so looking around here today, of course, gives me great hope that we can save the affordable connectivity program. I see folks in the room who, like me, are fired up and feel a fierce, fierce urgency of now. I know I do. And so I'm honored to stand shoulder to shoulder with you all here today, like we have been for quite some time, ringing that alarm bell to raise awareness about the importance, the critical importance of ACP and help to make that final, final push so that we can get this program refunded. So pending before Congress is the ACP Extension Act, that bipartisan, bicameral bill to provide additional funding to keep the program from lapsing. And so uh, I'm hopeful that she'll make it here today, but uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, uh, and we know we'll see Senator Peter Welch, uh, but thank them truly for their leadership introducing this legislation and really doing the hard work that they're doing on their end, uh, making that push so that we can get this funding for ACP. But you and I, we're here today for a unified purpose. What is that? It's to fight for ACP. I've said it before and I'll say it again, ACP is simply the most effective program that we've ever had in getting low, incomes con uh, low income Americans connected and keeping them connected. In fact, it's been the most successful program ever in our decades long bipartisan push to crack the digital divide. But you don't have to just take my word for it. I have traveled across this great country, met with folks enrolled in ACP, and I want to take a minute to share just a few of their stories. We can talk about policy all day here, but I want to talk about people for a minute. I've met a senior who told me that after moving, it was the Affordable Connectivity Program that enabled her to get and stay connected with her home community and her family through those precious video Zoom calls. And she attended Zoom Church, she called it, <laughs> for how she was able to continue her worship. A veteran in Illinois who contacts his VA online to check the status of his medications, set up his chronic health care appointments that he needs. A father in Akron, Ohio, who told me that he was able to update his resume apply for jobs that he and his family needed online. A mother of four in Chicago who told me that ACP kept her children from falling behind 
on their coursework. And then, of course, I'll never, ever forget Deborah. It's almost like I could see her here uh, in the audience. Uh, and she's the one who told me and asked me. And you could see the concern. You could see the worry. She said, am I going to have to eat less food in order for me to be able to continue my internet connection? <laughs> doesn't have to be this way. These are just a few of the people who I've heard from who rely on ACP each and every day. And while everyone, of course, has their own unique individual story that makes them themselves, all these stories shared a common thread, a common message. And it was that ACP was essential to me and to my household. And so from my point of view, ACP has, is the program that has helped transform the digital landscape, making internet access more equitable and empowering everyday Americans to get more and more connected. And so as we've heard, but I want you to hear from me, today marks a critical point in our efforts to refund ACP as it is that final day that enrolled households will receive their full program benefit. And that's because we are officially now in the wind down phase of the ACP program. The money has run out. At the SEC, we're doing everything that we can to stretch the very, very last little amount of funding that we have to keep households connected. But beginning tomorrow, enrolled households will only receive a partial credit towards their monthly internet bill. Many households will have to face a tough choice. <clears throat> Confront that rising internet bill or disconnect them and their household from the internet. We've made real progress, y'all, in closing the digital divide through ACP and we cannot afford to slide backwards. And so, as I said at the start, I do believe in that fierce urgency of now on behalf of the 23 million households nationwide and the 63,806 households here in D.C. that rely on this program. I'm here to fight for you today. We've got to continue and rally hard to keep the pressure and momentum going until we see this through to save ACP. And I got to tell you, this is not my first rally for ACP. <laughs> And in fact, I did one with Chris and with Yvette Clark not a month ago on the footsteps of New York's City Hall. But what I want to tell you is that uh, there were probably five or six senior African-American women that were in Yvette Clark's district who were ACP enrollees. And so each of us came up and gave our little speech, did our little thing. But these ladies were listening closely to everybody's speech. And let me tell you, if you said something that they heard, they'd say, and that ain't right. <laughs> telling you, telling you. Can y'all say that with me here? One, two, three. That ain't right. That ain't right. It's a rally, y'all. One, two, three. That ain't right. That ain't right. Here we go. So we're going to do a little bit of this call and response. We'll see how we do here, everybody. Here's why I'm fired up. We've got 23 million households enrolled in ACP that are going to get cut off. We've got veterans and their military families who rely on this program. People who have served America and they're going to be on the wrong side of the digital divide. We've got young learners who are going to have to go back to those McDonald's parking lots in order to finish their homework. We've got job seekers who are looking in this economy right now, who want to work, who are looking for the skills that they need, and instead we're going to pull the plug on them. And we've got seniors who rely on telehealth, rely on their visits with their teleprovider, and they also are going to get cut off. I got to tell you, y'all, that ain't right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Starks. Uh, wow, that that, is, that isn't right. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, we're so glad that both of you are here and speaking up and continue to speak up. 
Uh, I know we've got representatives from uh, the chairwoman's office here as well, and she's passionate about this issue. Uh, the FCC knows what time it is. It's time to restore the Affordable Connectivity Program, and we appreciate all of you. Um, uh, the, the, the commissioner mentioned it's a bipartisan bill, and uh, uh, you know, just last week we saw a letter from 20 uh, some House Republicans urging the Speaker of the House to do something and to make this happen. We thank them. Uh, and there's been letter after letter from bipartisan governors to members in both chambers. Um, everyone says they support this. It's time for action. Um, we also have the White House in support of this program, and that's critically important. And we're very grateful uh, that here, following, pushing, working this issue uh, is uh, a whole team at the White House, but representing them, uh, the National Economic Council Deputy Director, John Donenberg is here. We want to invite him up to give a few remarks. So, John, thank you for being here. Come on up. Thank you for that. Oh, yes. Hey. Pick up a couple inches. Thank you for that. And thank you, Commissioner Starks and Commissioner Gomez, for your remarks today and for really fighting to extend the Affordable Connectivity Program. As you noted, my name is John Donenberg. I'm the Deputy Director of President Biden's National Economic Council. Like many of the advocates here today know, when President Biden thinks about the economy, he really thinks about it from the perspective of a family sitting around the kitchen table trying to pay the bills, you know, balancing groceries, rent, utilities, health care, child care, and all of the other essentials. And let's not kid ourselves affordable, reliable, high-speed internet is essential in modern America. This is not a luxury. It is a requirement for Americans to be able to effectively participate in school, to do their jobs, to access modern health care, to stay connected to their loved ones. You know, and Commissioner Spark, uh, Starks spoke so movingly about some of those stories. We know that they are true. And that is why the president is committed to making sure that every household in America has access to reliable, high-speed internet by 2030. We're not there yet, and we know from the data that disparities in internet access continue to disproportionately impact communities of color, veterans, our military families, rural communities, and older Americans. We also know that these disparities cause real harm to far too many people. And it is really for those reasons that the president is such a strong advocate for the affordable connectivity program. As we have heard, and as you all know, ACP is the largest and most successful internet affordability program in the history of this country. There are 23 million households enrolled. That is an extraordinary number. It is one in every six households in the country. Nearly half of these are military families. A quarter of them are seniors. This program is having an enormous effect and unfortunately, if it disappears, that will have an enormous effect too. You know, in a recent FCC survey, more than three quarters of ACP households said that losing the ACP would disrupt their internet service. And with program funding fully running out next month, we are talking about over 15 million families that could be at risk of losing their internet connections. That is not acceptable. And it shouldn't be acceptable to any of us. And that is why, starting in last October, President Biden began calling on Congress to extend this benefit, at least through 2024. Democratic members and senators have joined him in this effort. As we have heard, there has been bipartisan support for this program. There are Republican members who have supported this program. But we should speak plainly. So far, Republican leaders in Congress have failed to act. So once again, before it is too late, the president is calling on Republican leaders to step up and join their rank and file and join Democrats to fund the ACP. There are a lot of ways to do it. We have heard about some of those ways today. Congresswoman Clark has a wonderful proposal in the House. There are proposals in the Senate that could save ACP by authorizing new spectrum auctions. There are a lot of different approaches, but the truth is any real solution will require bipartisan agreement. That is the nature of where we are in our government. Now, it shouldn't be hard to get bipartisan agreement. This is not 
a partisan issue. Access to the internet is essential no matter who you voted for or where you live. And in fact, there are millions of ACP recipients in every state and every congressional district in America, no matter what color that district is. So the question in front of us today is planned. And that question is whether Republican leaders in Congress will act to protect millions of their own constituents through 2024, or whether they will simply shut off this essential program. The president does not want that to happen. The FCC does not want that to happen. I do not want that to happen. And that is why the president is urging congressional Republicans to get their leaders to come to the table and lower internet costs for American families. Now, even as we fight to extend ACP, the president is not slowing down on his internet for all agenda. We are taking a number of actions that are designed to lower internet costs and improve access for American families. Many of you have been involved in these efforts or are tracking these efforts. This includes a historic expansion of broadband infrastructure to every single corner of this country. That expansion, by the way, includes a legal requirement for states and territories to make sure there's a low cost option for families and that will still be here. We are also working with providers who currently have millions of ACP customers so that they will act to keep those customers connected by offering low cost plans or no cost plans. And several of those providers have already answered the administration's call and we hope that that will continue and that those systems will continue to expand. So we will continue this fight to lower costs for internet, uh, for internet access for all families. But that starts with extending the ACP. And I am hopeful that we'll be able to get there. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for representing the president today. We appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna ask our, our lightning round panel to come on and make your way up here. Uh, so that we can get rolling but we, uh, as they make their way, Elisa and her wonderful panel are gonna make their way up here. Um, I'll just remind folks that uh, yes, you can take action. We're talking about how do we get action now in Congress? Uh, there's so many, you go to our partners' websites. I, I named some of them earlier. Many of them have actions, we have actions. Uh, there's a great uh, coalition website called don'tdisconnectus.org. You can go to that right now and learn how to contact your member of Congress um, so that we get every member telling leadership we're ready to move this bill right now. Um, all right, we've just about got our panel up here. And uh, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Elisa Valentin. Elisa Valentin is the Broadband Policy Director of Public Knowledge and uh, is doing a great job of leading our work on this fight. Elisa, take it away. I'm actually going to remix things a little bit okay. and introduce the senator. Okay, we can do that. All right. I did mention earlier we were expecting one of our lead sponsors to be here, and he is here. Um, along with uh, Congresswoman Clark, who wanted to be here, but uh, I believe had a vote she had to take care of, uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick on the Republican side, Senator Vance on the Republican side. Again, a bipartisan effort. We have one of the other of the four original co-sponsors of the ACP uh, uh, restoration bill, uh, and that is Senator Peter Welch, who has been a longtime champion of rural communities, of communities that are disconnected to have access to broadband. Senator Welch, thank you so much for coming to the rally today. Everyone, let's welcome you. Hey, sorry to uh, interrupt your presentation, all right? I apologize, all right? Or, uh, but it's, it's so good to be here with you, uh, Chris, uh, Commissioner, uh, Yvette, my friend from the days that we worked together in the House. We were classmates uh, in the House, and uh, I've ditched her, and uh, she's holding the fort over there with Marjorie Taylor Greene and a lot of her uh, new friends. <laughs> it's amazing. So I, number one, want to thank you for uh, your continued advocacy. Uh, and it's not just because you're staying the course on this. But at the core of why you're advocating is an appreciation for how important it is for lower income folks, for seniors, for 
four million veterans to have that just little bit of help that allows them to stay connected. And we in this country can obscure the reality of how hard it is to be poor and the extraordinary difficult choices that folks who can't pay their bills at the end of the month have to make. The anxiety of juggling bills. The shame in some cases of not being able to get your son or daughter a new pair of shoes for school. The trauma, really, of wondering whether you're going to be able to put that meal on the table. And that's the reality of life for a lot of Americans. The stock market figures, the unemployment rate, the GDP, those are abstractions that have no meaning in the life of a person who is making $15,000 a year and has two kids. And we have a lot of Vermonters who are very much in that situation. And it's painful for me at times, as it is for you, when you're around folks who don't understand that. It's not that they're not necessarily mean, although some are. Well, let's give them credit. <laughs> but you have it in your bone marrow that there's a lot of people that just are having that struggle day in and day out. And for those people, they need access to high-speed internet just like they need access to electricity. This is what is required in a modern economy. And, you know, for them to do the things that are so essential, a doctor's appointment, right? They don't have a car maybe or it's broken down and the internet means they can have that appointment. They want to apply for a job. You can't show up in a lot of places now. You've got to go online in order to be able to apply for your job. And then, of course, you have kids and they've got to do their homework and stay connected. But, you know, the other thing, the letters that we get from Vermonters, a lot of them are from older people in their mid-80s and what they, they fixed income, it's the only way they stay connected to their loved ones. And how much does that mean emotionally to, the, to those folks, right? So how is it that 30 bucks means so much to these families, to these individuals, to these veterans, and Congress can't get its act together to keep that up? And then some of the opponents say it's really not a big deal. It's only $30, right? So the moral imagination is stunted when you can't understand only $30 to you, but not to that veteran, not to that mom of $15,000 and two kids. And some of my colleagues are saying they have some study that says it won't make a difference. You know what makes a difference? Everything makes a difference when you're on the margin like that. And the profoundest the decision we made, and this was a victory for a lot of us advocates, you very much, was it before going into COVID, when a lot of us were advocating for broadband build out to rural America, a lot of my urban colleagues didn't think it was a big deal. COVID came and we saw it was a game changer. If you didn't have access to the internet, you just couldn't do all the things we just discussed. And that changed. So we're getting it built out. But just think, if you're on that dirt road in Vermont and the cables are right out in front of your house or mobile home and you can't connect because you don't have the 100 bucks or 130 bucks or whatever it is and it's getting more expensive. But then you have this lifeline where you have figured out how with this $30 you are going to be connected. And you now have come to rely on that. And it's a good thing to rely on. It's a good thing because it gives you a little bit of independence. 
It gives you some capacity to help your kids or to see your doctor, to be independent. And then to hear in Washington that we can't, quote, find the money. So this is not about can we find the money. It's about are we committed to the priority and the well-being of really wonderful people who are struggling. So, you know, our goal now is the fully funding of the ACP, seven billion dollars, and we're going to keep we're going to keep making noise. We're going to find a vehicle, and we're going to find the money. We won't go into the details now, but keeping the noise up really, really matters. And the noise is not just to be loud; it's to embrace the aspirations of those. 25 million households in this country who feel connected and don't want to have that connection cut and them left behind, their kids left behind, that veteran's capacity to reach out to another veteran who may share a wartime trauma that only one each other can help console one another. So this really matters to our heart as a country. And whether we're a country where when we have something that we acknowledge is essential, like electricity and like high-speed internet, we back it up with the capacity of people to connect and just don't make them feel miserable that it's right out in front of their home, but they can't connect themselves. So I end where I began, and that is to say thank you. Thank you not just for your advocacy, but thank you for being the heart of America, where we understand we have to do things with public policy to make it personally possible for all of the people among us to have the things that they need to have any shot at thriving, being connected, and having a prosperous, if lower income, wonderful life. Thank you. We're going to do it. We are going to do it. Thank you, Senator Welsh, for making the time. We know how busy things are here in Washington, and we, we really appreciate you being here and representing your colleagues who are pushing for this. Now I am going to turn it over to the amazing Lisa Valentin, who is going to lead our, our lightning panel here and introduce our panelists. I could, yes, you want this microphone. I'm getting used to sharing more. There we go. I just wanted Chris to go through that struggle of getting the mic off and not me. Hi, everyone. Um, again, now I have to go through the struggle of actually holding it here. My name is Lisa Valentin, uh, Broadband Policy Director at Public Knowledge. Thank you so much for being here. I love that we have a full house at the library at noon. I appreciate it, y'all. Like we've been trying to scramble to find seats, so this is amazing, an amazing turnout. So thank you all to the panelists uh, for being here today. Um, I know we just heard Commissioner Stark say that it's, you know we got to talk policy, but we also have to talk people. And so I want to begin uh, by speaking with uh, Taylor here, uh, who's joining us. It's a very busy time in your life. She's studying for finals right now. She's in law school at Catholic Law. So thank you for taking the time to join us here today, because we know that you have things that you need to be doing. Um, so I want to chat with you a little bit about the fact that you're an ACP recipient. So I want you to just talk us through your story, how you came to be enrolled in ACP, and what ACP means to you as a law student. Yes, well, thank you very much, um, Elisa, and for public knowledge for allowing me to come today to share my experience. Um, this is the first panel I have ever spoken on, so this is a very exciting <laughs> So um, apologies if my brain is full of UCC commercial code right now, but anyway. <laughs> um, so yes, I am an ACP recipient. I live here in DC. I'm in law school. I live in this neighborhood. This is my library that I go to all the time. Um, so this is a really, really great event that we're having. Um, ACP has been so helpful while I have been in law school and unable to work full time. I'm able to work part time, but um, I'll be very honest that I had a very sudden um, change of circumstances while I've been in law school. And I, there were things that I simply just couldn't plan for. So I'm an example of a person who has made seemingly all the right decisions. I'm 
in pursuit of my education. I'm starting my career, but I know that I need a little financial help right now. And ACP has been that for me while being in law school, um, especially this summer when I'm studying for the bar and I'm applying for the bar. All of that is done online now. And I'm in the process of applying to jobs and fingers crossed, we'll get interviews. Those are all done online now on Zoom. Um, and so point blank period, I need an internet connection and that bill has to get paid no matter what means possible. Um, and thankfully with ACP, I've been able to pay my internet bill without having to worry about paying for tuition, books, professional clothing, anything else that I need to buy while I'm in law school. Um, and that $30 a month or $360 a year is a lot to a student. It's been a lot to me. Um, and also losing my ACP credit will absolutely be disruptive in my life. Thankfully, I'm only financially responsible for myself and I'm from South Louisiana, so I can whip up a pretty mean red beans and rice recipe for very cheap and be fine. But I can't help but think about parents or individuals who are financially responsible for much more than just themselves. And they deserve to be connected to the internet just as much as me. And they might also be in pursuit of education or applying for jobs, but they have a greater need to feed their families. And I get that. Um, so losing ACP will greatly impact every person, every ACP recipient, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Taylor. <laughs> So um, now we're going to uh, turn it over to you, Amina. Amina had uh, the tech policy work taking place at Common Sense. So Amina, um, I just want to hear, you all have been collecting various stories from your partners and schools. And so I just want to hear some of the things um, that you're hearing lately from our youngest learners, especially because we know that we're on the heels of summer vacation. So what are you all hearing at Common Sense? Yes, thanks um, for having me here today. Um, so at Common Sense, we've been tracking how kids and families, students um, use technology. And one thing that we know is that there are, according to our research, about 16 million students in the persistent digital divide. So it's incredibly helpful to have a program like ACP that helps them connect and stay connected because these kids need to have access to the internet throughout their entire school career. And what we're hearing from families is that the ACP has connected them so that their kids can do schoolwork, um, but not just parents. Um, kids are often encircled by a whole world of loving caregivers, grandparents, aunts and uncles. And when you are a low income family, you're often reliant on this circle of community around you. And what's special about the ACP is that it ensures that that full circle goes around the student so that when they go to their auntie's house after school, because that's the child care, the free child care that their family can afford, they have ACP. They can do their homework. They can stay connected. When they go to their grandparents' house, and this was one of the first stories that we heard when we started doing ACP outreach work in Arizona, was a grandmother who was so excited to be able to connect to the internet because she wanted to have internet at home for her grandchildren so that they could do their schoolwork. So ACP ensures not only are the students connected, but they're connected where they need to be, where they can be safe and do their work safely. And that's fair. So that's equity in education because for well-resourced students, these aren't concerns for their parents. Their parents know at home, they're connected, no problem. Their parents know that they've got service that can follow them around because they can afford that extra service and that extra cost. But when you are not in a well-resourced household and you're in a low-income household and you've got students, you're constantly thinking about where can my kid finish their homework? And right now, we're about to head into May, we've got kids who, and I'm gonna do a little bit of good news here, that have been digging out of pandemic, like learning debt, right, learning loss. We've heard all the stories. Well, there's a bit of good news. Um, back in February, there was research that showed that students were making gains 
in reading. They're still behind in math, but they are making gains in reading. Kids are working hard to catch up. ACP has been there to help them do that. And now we are in May and we're about to lose this just as they're finishing up their end of year projects, just as they're preparing for their end of year exams, just as they're gearing up for summer session. What are they going to do without internet access? Do their families have to make a choice between medicine or food or work? That's just not fair. Thank you, Amita, for laying that out for us. So next we're gonna to go to Kevin, um, who is coming to us from the DC government. Uh, oftentimes we have these conversations in the Beltway, but we don't involve our city officials in DC. So we thought it was really important to bring Kevin to the conversation. So Kevin, can you talk with us a little bit about what you all are doing in the district, especially because about one in five households in DC is enrolled in ACP. So what are you all doing right now to make sure that people are informed about the fact that the program is ending? And just what are you hearing from the families in DC about what kind of sacrifices that they're going to be making so i uh represent the office of the chief technology officer uh here in dc and uh that office encompasses the uh our state broadband uh, and digital equity office uh, but under um, our powers or our outreach we have a uh, a series of programs that we uh, do for the community, such as, uh, you know, digital literacy training and, and various other uh, programs that are beneficial to D.C. residents. Um, as it pertains to the ACP program, uh, our office uh, is very pleased with the results that we have had. We have uh, achieved uh, 56% uh, percent, uh, adoption under the ACP program here within the district. And that is an incredible number. That's actually 16% uh, higher than the national average. So what that is telling you is that there is a real and palpable need here within the district, but it also shows that uh, we can't afford to let ACP go away. And so what my office has been doing, uh, taking it from the, the business side, uh, we have been proactively reaching out to the ISPs and talking with them and saying, hey, you know, it's the program is potentially coming to an end. Um, what are some of the things that you have in place to assist uh, our residents? Uh, with regards to if if that were to happen, and we've been getting uh, you know uh, different responses. Um, uh, s uh, many of them have said that they are making provisions for if that happens with uh, you know uh, transitioning ACP customers over to Lifeline, for example. The issue with that is that uh, the eligibility qualifications don't always necessarily 100% line up when it comes to lifeline versus acp uh, so there are some people that may be caught uh, in that transition uh, and then the other thing is that some uh, providers are, are not uh, eligible uh, to provide lifeline such as a lot of the wireless providers for example uh, so what we've been doing is just trying to take a proactive approach to saying you know, if D-Day were to come, what do we have in place to uh, capture all of these people that have signed up under the program that we want to transition? Uh, so as I said, that's an ongoing, uh, you know, project that we're, we're still doing or conversations that we're still having, but I'm really urging uh, Congress uh, to keep this program going because it's necessary because so many families uh, rely on this uh, to connect them to the world and to have opportunities that they wouldn't have any other way. And so I think that there is a huge responsibility on our part, not just as leaders, but as Americans, to do the right thing. So I'm asking Congress to please do the right thing and keep this program going because it will be uh, tremendously beneficial uh, to our citizens. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. So William, a uh, similar question for you. William is joining us from the city of Baltimore where he uh, is on the digital equity team there. We're so glad that you could come down and join us in DC today. I know I saw you a couple weeks ago as well at another conference. So I just wanna you know, hear more about like what you're hearing in Baltimore. I know that you're engaged like with the community on a daily basis. What are you hearing from your community members about what an affordable, reliable broadband connection means to them? Well, first, thank you all for having this a rally and I and I apologize because my colleagues here on the panel have been very professional and things like that but I can't do a rally <laughs> what we're doing in Baltimore is that we're Cat Williams said it best 2024 is the year of the truth we are calling the truth about what's going on in real life the reality is that I'll give you one story there was a young lady uh, an older doll I she corrected me. An uh, older adult who came uh, to an event that we were having, re ACP registration event with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. Um, she got there. She had recently had a stroke within the last year. She had uh, a private nurse, oh, a nursing care. The nurse that came with her, stayed with her overnight and things like that. She now has a heart monitor to monitor blood pressure. She was diabetic, but she can't keep up with that now, so she has a diabetic monitor. If she goes to sleep and she doesn't have broadband, and her blood sugar goes down, she will die. That's not hyperbole. That's, that's not an exaggeration. This is the life she lives, day to day, in and out. And ACP literally makes the difference in her ability to get all of the new meds she needs. So don't get it twisted. She has new meds all over the place, but she also needs this connectivity as much as the meds. That is what this is about. This isn't about, uh, you know, my health monitor. So I'll lose a couple of pounds here or there. No, this is about staying alive. Uh, our mayor said that, Mayor Scott said that re, uh, renewal of the ACP is an issue of social justice. Mm -hmm. Hard stop. That's what this is. And actually, we're talking about $7 billion getting raised. We need $15 billion. This needs to be something that everybody has. It I don't need to be in a position where I'm struggling and, and I'm sitting in, oh, let's be, well, I'll tell you about myself. I, only, I grew up in D.C. up until I was 14, that I was kidnapped in Prince George's County. I escaped and went to Baltimore, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. I, I've been, I was in D.C. so long ago, I was born at Freeman's Hospital, okay? As we develop through these, I didn't grow up poor, just grow up poor. I've been poor in my adult life. I literally had to sit in my house in the dark because I was ashamed to tell anybody I needed something. I did that. I can't imagine what it's like to sit there with your children in a house and have to sit in the dark. Not because you're ashamed, because there's no other alternative. That is what the ACP means. We are literally talking about as part of an overall health package. Like, let's talk, forget about the money, because, you know, that's, hey, we believe in capitalism and competition and the best. We're talking about literally people staying alive. That's it. it it's, it's cool to talk about the health monitors. It's cool to talk about my grandson being able to play uh, uh, Roblox. Is that it? Okay, all right, Roblox. I, all I know is that he uses up five gigs of data a month. I, that's all I know. But that's not what this is about. That's not why we're here. We're here about, let's be honest, we're here about to talk about worthiness. That's what this is. Who is worthy? who have access to the internet and who is not. Who has the privilege of being able to just jump on their phone whenever they want to? That is what this conversation is. And if we vote not, if the vote is to not to uh, provide or to continue this, let's just be honest that we have determined that those people are not worthy. That's all we're talking about. The rest of it is just very pretty language. Are we going to keep people alive or are we okay with them dying because they're not us? Thank you so much. And you remind us of, you know, what the late Congressman John Lewis said, that access to the Internet civil rights issue of our time and definitely agree there. So um, let's talk a little bit about what our options are. Amina, I'm, I'm going to go to you. Can you kind of tell us, you know, where things stand right now? We heard um, a few of our policymakers, you know, talk about where things stand with ACP. But what are you all advocating for at Common Sense and even other people in the public interest community? What options exist for us to get this program funded in the short term? There are options on the table. So that's the good news. Congress still has time and Congress can act. 
Um, there is the ACP Extension Act, um, which has broad bipartisan support. Um, just a week ago, there were Republicans that banded together to send a letter to leadership, to Speaker Johnson, urging him to move forward with the ACP Extension Act. Um, on the Senate side, the same bill has been introduced um, by Senator Welch um, and Senator Vance. That's also advancing. There's also an opportunity for ACP to be funded as a part of a spectrum proposal. Um, it sounds really in the weeds and wonky, but I think what's important to note is that that means there's money for ACP extension and that there's an opportunity to move that right now. Um, so there are a lot of vehicles, as they say in Congress, there are a lot of opportunities for ACP to move. What should people do um, here in this room and online? Talk to your member of Congress. Tell your senators, tell your representatives right now, today, that we've got to move for an ACP and extension. We need to fund the ACP. We have to tell them this week. It's absolutely critical. There are milestones that are coming up over the next few days um, in Congress to review the spectrum proposal, to move that forward. Um, there are milestones in Congress related to other must-pass legislation that are coming up over the next few days. It's really critical that every member of Congress here right now that you all care about the ACP and that we must continue to fund the ACP. Thank you, Amina. Um, Kevin, I'm going to come back to you here, and I want you to talk us through kind of like the intersection of ACP, of B funding, and Digital Equity Act. You're uh, leading up this work in D.C. as it relates to B funding, Digital Equity Act. So how will the loss of funding for ACP impact B funding and Digital Equity Act funding here in D.C.? Oh, without a doubt, it would, uh, it would impact us uh, in a negative way. Uh, to be honest, we we have seen that uh, for uh, folks who uh, utilize the ACP program, that that thirty dollar uh, price point is the sweet spot. That is really what is necessary to keep folks on the internet. Uh, if that price goes above that, we're going to run into problems where they won't they won't be able to afford it. Yeah, all of the, the surveys that we've done, the research that we've done, it, it comes down to affordability. The $30 is what, or, or below, or, or free, is what will keep customers, subscribers, residents, Americans connected, and that's what we need. So. Uh, when it comes to the BEAD and DE grants, affordability is a huge component of that. And so to remove ACP, remove the affordability component away from BEAD and DE would be problematic. So I don't want to see that because I know that that would affect adoption. And adoption is what we need to make sure that all Americans are connected. So. Just placing the infrastructure there uh, is great, which is what the B program will do. But once the infrastructure is there, then we need to connect the people to the infrastructure, and we will do that through ACP. Absolutely. All right, William, um, I also want to talk about the role of digital navigators as well. You know, we talk about kind of like the loss of, you know, trust when it comes to, you know, the government programs, but also there's a lot of people that have been working to sign people up for these programs across the country. So how does the loss of funding for ACP impact the relationship that digital navigators have with those recipients? One of the things that happens often, especially in communities that have been disinvested over time, is that they get used to being disinvested over time. Mm -hmm. And so and we, one of the biggest challenges that we have going into community is like, you all said this before, the guy who had your job beforehand, he said that before. The guy who used to work over there, the lady who brought this in another department, may not have been broadband, maybe it was electricity, maybe it was light bulb. They, they all said the same thing. And as soon as the funding was over, as soon as somebody, no, not even, the, one of our older adults told me, she said, I said, oh, you know, we're really trying to do this and help you guys out with these types of services. She said, honey, how long you worked there? <laughs> I said, I've been here about six months, you know, I'm new to it. She said, okay, when you've been here for three years, come back and talk to 
me and then I'll believe what you say. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say anything. I, except I made an appointment with her for two and a half years from then. <laughs> yeah. Because that's, that's what she set the model. She set yeah. the standard for what it will take for me to trust you. Bet. I don't get to determine for her what, what the trust metric is. That's where the digital navigators, especially the ones that we've been using in Baltimore, come in. They are staff and residents at the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. They are residents who have demonstrated commitments and demonstrated ability in getting into communities and having community members follow them and move them. When we're doing our digital equity fund, which is the way we took some of our uh, uh, ARPA money and how we put it back into the community, one of the things we did very deliberately is that we transformed the requirements for application to be more reflective of the actual people doing work on the ground. <laughs> Let's be very clear. Most of the people in our communities, in the communities we're talking about, the ones that are the you know, covered populations, not everybody else, but the ones in the covered population, the programs in those communities normally started because somebody said, well, you don't know how to do that? Well, I'll show you. And then you and then all of a sudden, it didn't start with, you know what would be real cool? If I just fill out 990s every year. <laughs> oh, I dream of fun development all the time. No, that did not happen for them. And so, it, and I beat up on Hopkins all the time. What ends up happening is that uh, the Little Flowers Daycare Center cannot compete with Johns Hopkins. They literally have people who are paid lots of money. I'm not going to quote anybody's salary, but lots of money to write these grants. So we said no. We're going to redo this because these are the important people. Who knows how long my job is going to be there, but they are going to be there long after I'm gone. And that is how we work with the digital navigators because it is the trust in the, because they shouldn't trust the city. They just shouldn't. Not that we're bad. We're bad. It is that our rules are vastly different. Our rules, and I was talking to Chris about this earlier, procurement rules are specifically designed to reduce and eliminate as much corruption as possible. But what it also does is in the digital ecosystem, it makes things very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So for example, we're talking, if the, one of my concerns is that if the ACP stops, I know what it takes on the government side to get something started again. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, oh, it'll be over May. Let's say they reauthorize it in June. How long is it gonna take NTIA to get all of the, because what happened to the people who were working there first? Do we just have them sitting there until if ACP comes back? No, we reprogram them. So now when ACP comes back, the money's there, procurement has to get re-involved again. Uh, finance has to get re-involved again. The lawyers, oh, the lawyers. The lawyers have to show. I'm one too, so that's one of the reasons I'm talking about you. But all of this stuff has to happen. Why would you trust us? We, and, and we have to do that. That is not the expectation that our community members have. They are, feel, they are given misinformation primarily through sales. Like I know when a new phone comes out and it's 6G, I'm going to need it, but I literally have no idea how many Gs I actually need in my life to effectively do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. It is really about going into the community in, in a way that is not just relevant, but is connective. One of our, and, and I'll end on this, one of our community members, Timothy Smith, he said the solution to closing the digital divide is human. Once we put humanity back in this process, we will be much closer to doing it. Thank you so much, William. Great. Taylor, we're gonna let you have the last word here. Uh, what is your ask of Congress? Oof, that is a loaded question, especially following William. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Um, but I'll give it a shot. Um, this program absolutely helps everyone. Um, I live here in D.C. now, but I'm from rural South Louisiana, and in my home district, 30% of homes are ACP enrollees. Um, so this program is important for everyone across the country, no matter your station in life, no matter who your elected official is, no matter what political party you vote for, but I think that everyone in this room already knows that. Um, so specifically of Congress, I would ask every member to ask their staffers and their interns who are ACP recipients because living in DC and having friends who are staffers and interns, I know exactly how many people are ACP recipients. Um, and from, from a personal viewpoint, if Congress and policymakers, respectfully, can't work together for a program as positive as this one, that's very disheartening for me. As someone who is actively studying laws and policies of this country, I believe in the, po in the positive change that policies can have. That's why I went to law school in the first place. But those policies can only have a positive change if the government is willing to help them. So 
I leave off with urging policymakers and Congress to use whatever vehicle necessary to refund ACP. I'm available. There's a lot more to my story that I didn't share today. I'm available to meet with anyone in this room to share that story, and more importantly, anyone who's not in this room who needs to be convinced that ACP is extremely important for everyone in this country. Thank you, Taylor. All right, so I think we're gonna take just probably one question from the audience. I know that's a lot of pressure, so um, we're over time. And I, I would make it good, let the question be an actual question and not a dissertation before said question, okay? So who in here has a question? And let's you know, keep in mind kind of the perspectives we have here. We have someone from the DC government, we have an ACP recipient, we have someone who leads tech policy, and then we have uh, someone, well, he can answer any question, our friend over there, really, um, whether it be about digital navigators, policy issues, et cetera. So is there, does anyone have a question in the room that you want to ask um, our panelists? Or did I scare people enough about it? <laughs> No questions? So you all feel like we covered it all? We know what our next steps are? Okay, yeah, good. Can you get to the mic, please? Oh, there's a mic, yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh. Hey, y'all, I'm Raylan Oberson with Common Cause, and I lead a group of folks called the Digital Democracy Activists. These are volunteer activists from all over the country who have been making calls, writing their, their Congress people, um, helping their community get enrolled in the ACP. So, these folks are seeing today and they're saying, wow, what has all of this work been about if our Congress is not being held accountable to the people? So what do you say to all of those folks who are still calling, writing letters, and looking to get this ACP Extension Act passed? So what words of encouragement or things you have to say to those folks? Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's an iterative process. That's one of the things that people need to understand, and that's part of the challenge. Government moves at a very, very slow pace by design, and our needs are moving exponentially. And that inconsistency is what drives it. My, my uh, opinion to them or my advice to them is keep calling. Actually, after it's over, call. Regardless of what happens. So let me tell you what I'm going to do then. I apologize. <laughs> I am calling everyone. Some of my letters are very polite, and some of them are not. Um, because. Again, we need to make, and the ones that aren't out of places I live, let's be careful, I've already voted for you, so I, I feel I'm owed. Um, <laughs> and, but that is, that is it, you don't stop, because at the point that they find out that they can placate you, that will be all you will need. Because mm -hmm. if they do decide to go with seven billion, I'm gonna say thank you and say, where's the other seven and a half? Where's the other eight? Uh, we need more money, because it is too, they're, they're, the elected officials' lives are too complicated and deal with too many things for us to let up at all. Sorry. And I think once, once those real stories of real people get out, it, it makes it hard for leaders to turn away because we're talking about real people, real lives, not just covered populations, but all Americans who, you know, for whatever reason may not be able to afford the cost of bandwidth, connectivity. And so it makes a difference. And can you imagine, any of us here in this room, can you imagine what your life would be like if you had no internet connect connectivity? Mm -hmm. If you thought about it, it would be really difficult, not just to do your jobs, but just waking up in the morning connecting to your family, connecting to your friends, not being able to do that. That's what this is going to mean for a lot of people if ACP goes away. So once you put it in that human perspective, then we all can connect to that and identify with that and make a difference. So keep calling and keep writing and keep the effort up. Absolutely. All right, round of applause for our panelists. Thank you all so much. I'm going to bring Chris Lewis up here for some closing remarks. Oh. All right. Thank you again, panelists. Let's hear it for them. They're phenomenal. We're going to wrap things up here. I just want to, uh, as we close, uh, thank, first of all, our partners, uh, 
National Digital Inclusion Alliance, National Hispanic Media Coalition, Digital Progress Institute, Civic Nation, and our media partners, Broadband Breakfast, for helping us put this on. And thank all of you who are watching, all of you who are here, all of you who understand the urgency that we hear on the ground and from folks who are experienced and understand why this program is important. Uh, these are people's lives that are at risk, and they are in danger of of being harmed uh, if this program goes under. And and what did Commissioner Starks tell us that means? I can't hear you. What did he say that means? That ain't right, yeah, right y'all. So we want you to talk to your members of Congress. Go to don'tdisconnectus.org. Check out all of our partners' websites as well. All of these opportunities to contact your member of Congress, and as we heard, keep calling. Keep calling until this program gets restored. Thank you all for being here. Um, Elle is going to come up and give you a few more. You got a few more instructions, Elle? Yeah, just a few more. All right, Lauren's going to come up here and close us out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right, thank you all so much for coming. If you've taken any pictures, please post them with the hashtag SaveACP. Please get a QR code card on your way out. It, <clears throat> sorry. It links to my blog post published last week and illustrates the ways that the Affordable Connectivity Program connects to other parts of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Thank you. Including BEAD and digital equity uh, including BEAD and the Digital Equity Act funding, as well as the FCC's digital discrimination rules. If you would like to schedule any follow-up interviews, please connect with Public Knowledge's Communication Director, Shiva Stella. Thank you all again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.